And you can't be around buffalo without knowing they have a spirit, a strong, powerful spirit. And it just grabs you. The plains land needs that spirit of the buffalo. So it's bringing that spirit back to a place that is hungering for that, hungering for that. Essentially, by the late 1890s, early 1900s, there were less than a thousand bison left in North America, less than a hundred left in Yellowstone Park. An Indian from the Salish Kootenai tribe was over east of the Rocky Mountains along the Milk River and came across six orphan calves and spent a little bit of time with them and uh, realized that would be a neat deal to take those home. So he was able to trail and have them follow him home, you know, through the Rocky Mountains and over to the Salish Kootenai Reservation. Michelle Pavlo was my great-great-grandfather. By 1896, they had 300 head of buffalo. So Michelle kept the buffalo, everything was going fine until they opened the reservation. They were gonna open the reservation for homesteading and he saw that, that that was going to be the end of his ability to run these buffalo on the reservation. So he contacted the United States government and asked if they would buy his buffalo and they said no. Teddy Roosevelt was interested, but they didn't allocate the funding, so he turned to Canada. Canada said yes, and in 1907 they drew up a deed and they said they would buy them at 200 a head delivered to Canada. By then it was 600 head of buffalo and shipped them to Canada by rail car. And that was called the Great Buffalo Rodeo because it was just absolutely something that's never been seen before. They had to reinforce the railroad cars, they had to reinforce wagons to be able to ship them. They had six horses pulling each wagon. They had um, cowboys that were the best of the best, they said. They were all of Indian descent, and they knew how to handle buffalo. If you're asking yourself, do bison belong on the prairie, it's, they absolutely do. Bison are a keystone species for the prairie. They're one of the main driving forces which actually form the entire prairie ecosystem. What we would consider a natural functioning prairie ecosystem, all the plants, all the animals, all the insects, all the birds, everything that would be in a natural system before homesteading before Indian tribes, before what we consider civilization took over and altered these landscapes. Those entire ecosystems will be forged by prairie dogs, bison, and fire. Those are, those are like three of the main driving forces which the entire ecosystem was completely adapted to all the plants and all the animals co-evolved with bison being the main grazing animal. The way that bison graze and the way they move across the land and the way they select plants uh, for forage and the way they wallow and the way they use the water is the way that the entire ecology of the prairie developed. One of the uh, overarching themes and goals of our project is to ultimately have the largest conservation herd of bison in the United States. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody here today to uh, Elk Island National Park of Canada. This is a uh, special event 
And, uh, we'll From the time that an individual bison enters into quarantine in Elk Island National Park on its way to import into the United States, the first thing that happens is it gets separated from the rest of the herd and from its mother. Uh, all the cows get put together into a quarantine facility. They're not allowed to have any contact with any of the other animals. The process of importation is, uh, it's sure not an easy one. It's a very complex process, challenging and very rewarding. Between the two USDA and CFIA, agencies in the U.S. and Canada, a lot of different stipulations are required on how the animals need to be handled. Once they're rounded up early to mid-November, we need to keep them separated from the herd up there for 60 days and do a, a disease testing for tuberculosis and brucellosis. We brand them with the CAN brand on the right hip that is required to meet the regulations. At the end of the 60-day quarantine, then they are approved for uh, shipping into the U.S. These are not domestic livestock. They're not used to people being close. They're not used to uh, handling facilities. And especially in this case, these are all calves that we import. And so they don't have the reassurance of the adult animals. They get loaded onto a, a livestock truck, just like cattle or pigs or sheep. And they make a, a pretty extensive journey down from outside, about 40 miles uh, east of Edmonton. And uh, they make it down, down to Malta, then about 50 miles south, where they're uh, offloaded into our handling facility uh, on the American Prairie Reserve. As each animal comes off the truck, we have to constantly be aware of the stress level of the animal. We have to make sure that we are quiet. Uh, we maintain visual breaks between ourselves and our operations and the animals themselves. Uh, the less that they can see of us, the less stressed out they'll be. We try to give them distance so that we're not directly outside of a very small enclosure that they are inside. The, the predator instinct takes over for them, especially being calves, and they're trying to get away from us. They're a very wild, extremely fast-reacting, very speedy animal, and I mean, they don't deal well with being in, in crowds and handled by people, and they can get hurt. So we try to mitigate that by First of all, the design of our handling facility. And then you also just have to have educated staff members who have gone through some basic training on what, what to do and what not to do. A single herd animal, especially a young calf, is gonna be under extreme amounts of stress when they're isolated by themselves, especially if they're in a small enclosed area. animals are pushed from one pin to the other until they get into the, the loading pin and then into the squeeze chute. At the front of the chutes we have a local veterinarian who's operating the chute and he's also doing the Brucella vaccine. We then do a second testing of the brucellosis and TB. They inject at the base of the tail of each animal, actual tuberculin, and then they have to read that three days later. So you have to run the animals all through again. So they've been in quarantine roughly 100 days. It's hard on the animals, but it's, they're gonna have a long life here ahead of them and produce a lot of calves and not have to have that handling again.
Well, this has been seven generations since Michelle and the Buffalo uh, Roundup. It's been a hundred years celebration this year. What the reserve is doing is not just bringing buffalo back, it's healing. It's healing that place. It's healing people because they're bringing back the spirit of the buffalo to the people. We need places like the reserve to remind us and reteach us what connection to the land, connection to the sky, connection to this earth is all about. We need that harmony back. And we need places like that to go to, to help that healing, to help bring that back, to help remind us what it is to be human. And I think the American Prairie Reserve can do that.